Andy Gibbs made it early in life becoming a millionaire just at the age of 20, but unfortunately, he lost everything he ever had, including his life at age 30. What was the secret to his success at such an early age, and what took him from riches to rags? Join us as we peel back the curtains to explore the life of Andy Gibbs, the most beloved member of the Bee Gees, from riches to rags, born into music. Andrew Roy Gibb was born to Barbara and Hugh Gibb on March 5, 1958 in Manchester, United Kingdom. He was one of those adorable kids born last in a family of seven. Andrew came after his four siblings, his sister Leslie Evans, and three brothers, Barry and fraternal twins Robin and Maurice. His mother Barbara was of Irish and English descent, while his father High was of Scottish and English descent. When Andy was just six months old, his parents left Manchester for Queensland, Australia, to settle on Crib Island just north of Brisbane. Andrew and his parents didn't really stay in one place for long. They moved between Brisbane and Sydney severally, until Andy returned to the United Kingdom in January of 1967. At the time, Andy's three older brothers had started to pursue their dreams as singers. So you see, Andy was not a singer that thought of doing what others did. He had music in him. His three brothers formed a group that they named the Bee Gees, and they went around to perform as a group. Soon, their group started to gain international fame around 1967, when Andy returned at the age of nine. Right from childhood, there's been something different about Andy, and it was in the way he made his choices. His mother described him as a little devil and a little monster. And that's because whenever Andy was sent to school, he'd sneak off to the stable and sleep with his two horses all day wandering back home around lunchtime reeking of horse manure. Whenever his mother asked him where he had been, he'd lie to her he had been at school all day. What a boy. To producer and film director Tom Kennedy, Andy was a cheeky lad. He said because High and Barbara doted on him, he would have a limo to go around London with his friends and 20 quid to go to the cinema. And even though he was underage, he would always ask Tom to buy him beer. Seemed Andy didn't care about candy much. The Bold Step You can imagine a boy like Andy who has been really exposed at such a young age. The young Andy who has not always been a fan of school finally took the bold step of dropping out at the age of 13. You know, most cases of school dropouts are those who had trouble at school, or had trouble with provisions. But in Andy's case, school just didn't seem like where he belonged. He chose to go after his dreams of being a musician, using an acoustic guitar that Barty gave him as his first instrument. Soon, Andy's parents moved to Spain, where Andy went from one tourist club to another in Ibiza, and later on the Isle of Man to perform. At age 16, Andy formed his first group, Melody Fair, named after a Bee Gees song, which included Isle of Man musicians John Alderson on guitar, Stan Hughes on bass, and John Stringer on drums. Barbara gave all of her support to her children as she helped Andy manage the group. Soon, Andy had regular bookings on the Small Islands hotel circuit. In 1973, Andy recorded his first song, My Father Was a Rebel, composed and produced by Maurice Gibb. But for some reason, this song was not released. Another track on the session performed by him was Windows of My World, co-written by him and Maurice. His brother Barry urged him to return to Australia in 1974. Barry believed that because Australia had been a good training ground for the Bee Gees, it would also help his youngest brother. Their only sister, Leslie, had remained in Australia, where she got married and raised a family with her husband. Some of Andy's band members, Anderson and Stinger, followed him to Australia with the hope of forming a band there. With Cole Joy producing, Andy, Alderson, and Stringer recorded several of Andy's compositions. The first song was a demo called To a Girl. His brother Maurice played organ to the song, which Andy later performed on his television debut in Australia on The Ernie Sigley Show. According to Sigley, the song was from Andy's forthcoming album, but in the end, the song was never released. In November of the same year, he recorded six demos, again produced by Joy, including Words and Music, Westfield Mansions, and Flowing Rivers, which was later released. Andy's musical journey in Australia was similar to his brother's. What may have detracted from the training ground aspect of Australia for Andy compared with his brother's was that Andy was relatively comfortable financially, mainly because of his brother's support and their largesse, hence the group's sporadic work rate. 
But soon, Andy's group had a problem. From time to time, Andy would disappear, leaving Alderson and Stringer out of work with no income. In low spirits, Alderson and Stringer had to leave for the UK. Into the spotlight. Andy later joined the band Zenta, consisting of Andy on vocals, Rick Alford on guitar, Patty Lelliot on bass, Glenn Greenhalgh on vocals, and Trevor Norton on drums. Zenta supported international artists Sweet and the Bay City Rollers on the Sydney leg of their Australian tours. And the band did not immediately become a good ground for Andy, but they were still making moves. Can't Stop Dancing, which was a Ray Stevens song and later a U.S. hit for the duo Captain and Tennille in May 1977 was mooted for release, but didn't happen. Although Andy performed it on television at least once on the revitalized bandstand show hosted by Daryl Summers, they never released it. Joy also produced Words and Music, which he released on the ATA label, only in Australia and New Zealand. This song was his first single, but was backed by another Andy Gibb composition, Westfield Mansions, and eventually the single reached the top 20 on the Sydney music charts in 1976. This ballad was one of his well-known hits. Later that year, Andy Gibb's greatest hits was released as a finale to his contract with RSO Records, with two new songs, Time is Time, and Me Without You, which was Andy's last top 40 chart entry shipped as singles. Other non-singles like After Dark and Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow were added to the album, the latter of which was a duet with P.P. P. Arnold, who had previously worked with Barry Gibb, including singing uncredited backups on Bury Me Down by the River from Cucumber Castle. Around the same time, Andy was invited to sing the first verse of Queen's Play the Game, and lead singer Freddie Mercury apparently was amazed by Andy's abilities. According to some sources, the tape was found in 1990 in a search of Queen archives for bonus tracks for a CD but was not used. Since it has not been heard by any Queen collectors, its existence is somewhat doubtful, although record producer Mac has also confirmed that the version does exist. Relationship and Addiction Andy soon joined his brothers, and in the Bee Gees group, he made it big courtesy of Barry writing the songs I Just Want to Be Your Everything and Love Is Thicker Than Water for him. Both songs shot to the top of the charts in 1977, and just like that, Andy became a heartthrob. At this time, Andy was just 19 when everything changed for him. He got married to Kim Reeder and moved to West Hollywood. There, Andy became seconded in the drug scene. This made RSO founder Robert Stigwood let him go as he could no longer deal with his cocaine addiction and behavioral problems. His wife, Reader, retreated to Australia and gave birth to their daughter, Peta, on January 1978. But this marriage didn't last for long. The same year, the couple divorced, leaving Andy free to date his way through Hollywood. Almost immediately, he started seeing starlet Susan George, eight years his senior. To some young people at the time, Andy's life may have seemed like a perfect fairy tale, but the truth is, something was off about him. According to the biography written by Bob Stanley titled, The Story of the Bee Gees, Children of the World, Andy would lounge around on his expansive bed in the room, where the home's previous owner, a drug lord, had been shot dead, staring at the mirrored ceiling and playing with guns. No one knew why he was acting the way he did at the time, it seemed off, but at the same time, he was not questioned. Against all odds, he also dated fellow music star Marie Osmond, well known as a squeaky clean Mormon. This relationship was considered a mismatch, as Andy did a lot of drugs while Marie didn't drink as little as Coca-Cola. Due to his addiction, the Osmond family was not happy with his relationship with Marie, and so they turned him away. Marie, who didn't want to go against her parents, also told Andy to stop calling her, and of course Andy was not ready to let go, forcing Marie to take legal action to stop him. But Andy moved on. He had another serious love, Victoria Principal. Maybe Victoria thought she could deal with Andy's addictions, but it turned out it was more than she could bear. It became so serious that Victoria had to put him in a tight spot. She asked that Andy choose between her and cocaine alcohol. But guess what? Andy looked into her eyes and told her he'd have to leave. The Unexpected Decline Before Victoria left Andy, he was still doing well for himself, especially outside the recording studio. 
He began working on several projects which included co-hosting the television music show Solid Gold from 1981 to 1982 with Marilyn McCoo. He also performed in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance in Los Angeles and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat on Broadway. But you see, Andy's cocaine binges got him fired from both Joseph and Solid Gold as he started being absent severally. The truth, according to those who worked with Andy on these projects, is that whenever Andy came to the theater, he brought joy because he was the best actor of the five people to play Joseph. But the problem was that Andy was not there enough. His colleagues soon started to notice whenever he came around, he'd look beat. He was like a little puppy that was ashamed of doing something wrong. He was all heart, but never had enough strength to carry through with what he was going through. While many people around him didn't know the reason for this change, an unnamed co-star in Joseph said, I hear he spent most of his time in his hotel room in front of the TV. I guess he was frightened and insecure. That's what happens when you're the baby brother of the Bee Gees. Could it really be that was what was putting his head under the water? Although Andy was going through a lot unknown to others, he didn't lose his charm and still performed with so much charisma. He was not difficult to handle. It was clear he wanted everyone to love him, but maybe he wasn't getting love and affection enough where he expected. Although things were rough between Victoria and Andy at this time, they still had work they did together. In August 1981, Andy and Victoria released a duet of the Everly Brothers' All I Have to Do is Dream. Andy reportedly heard Victoria singing in the shower and convinced her to go into the studio with him. This would be Andy's last official single and his last U.S. chart entry, peaking at number 51. It took time for Victoria to know what was really going on with Andy. She said she noticed that his behavior was becoming erratic and that he was becoming very thin. The next she saw was that the gentle and kind Andy that she had fallen in love with had become someone else. Over a while, she discovered that it had to be drugs that were affecting him. Their romance ended shortly thereafter when she gave him an ultimatum to choose between her or drugs. But soon after they broke up, even though Andy was not pleased with it, Andy started dating actress Carrie Michelson of the NBC television sitcom Gimme a Break. Andy met Michelson when he guest starred on the series for one episode, Help and Wreck. In 1984 and 1985, Andy did finish two successful contracts at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. At this point, almost everyone around him had known about his drug addiction. His family convinced him to seek treatment for his drug addiction, which included a stay at the Betty Ford Center in 1985. It was during this time that Andy began touring small venues with a stage show featuring his hits, as well as covers. He also appeared in guest-starring roles on the television sitcom Punky Brewster and Gimme a Break. Following an extensive tour of East Asia, he regularly performed shows in Las Vegas and Lake Tahoe. In 1984, he was the headline performer at the Vina del Mar Festival in Chile, performing two nights in a row. He also held a two-week engagement at San Francisco's historic Fairmont Hotel in March 1986. But despite all that Andy achieved, he was battling low self-esteem. Andy felt inadequate compared to his brothers, especially Barry's, achievements and talent. You'd wonder why, but he said in an interview, I didn't have any confidence. I always thought that people were buying my records as an extension to the Bee Gees, and I never thought there was an individual thing in there they liked. It seemed so unbelievable, but since we heard it from the horse's mouth, there's no doubt that he felt that way. For a spell, he lived in Miami on a giant houseboat called Shadow Dancer, a nod to one of his hit singles, with a pet lion cub for company. When the cub grew too big for the boat, he gifted it to the Miami Zoo and had to be talked out of buying a pet giraffe. Amidst all that Andy was going through, whether it was clear to his brothers or not, they never left him. After the Bee Gees ended their 1979 tour, Barry went straight into the studio to help Andy finish recording his third solo album. According to music producer Galutin, Andy was in such bad shape at the time that Barry ended up singing for his younger brother on most tracks. At that moment, it wasn't an Andy album anymore. That was Barry trying to rescue his brother. Andy's voice had been wrecked by cocaine and quaaludes, and it cost him lucrative work. Even though people kept giving him chances, without fail, 
Andy blew them. As early as 1982, things were not the same for Andy. He had started selling his belongings to make ends meet, flogging his jewelry for cash on Sunset Boulevard. But with the help he found in Betty Ford Center, Andy became clean by 1987, but he was very broke at this time. He has lost almost everything he had. He had filed for bankruptcy and was living on a weekly $200 allowance from his family. Everything was in shambles, even his family. He sporadically kept in touch with his ex-wife and daughter, Peta. But according to reports, management and family prevented Reader from actually contacting Andy. Reader also said in an interview, Peta and I were outcasts from the Gibbs. I once sent him pictures of Peta, but I had to do it through the fan club. Final Days In the spring of 1987, Andy went through another drug rehabilitation program and thought he had finally beaten his habits. He now aimed to get a recording contract for the release of a new album in 1988. He returned to the studio in June 1987 to record four songs. One of them, Man on Fire, was only released posthumously in 1991 on a Polydor Records anthology. Another track, Arrow Through the Heart, was the final song Andy would ever record and was featured on an episode of VH1's series Behind the Music and released on the Bee Gees Mythology 4-disc box set in November 2010. The songs are co-written by Andy with his brothers Barry and Maurice. Their demo recordings with engineer Scott Glassell were heard by Clive Banks from the UK branch of Island Records. Andy never formally signed a contract, but the record label planned to release a single in Europe that spring, followed by another single that summer with the album to follow. In early March 1988, Barry arranged for Island in England to sign Andy. But when he arrived in England in January 1988, he panicked. Andy missed meetings with the record company and blamed himself for his trouble writing songs. He moved to the UK to live with his brother Robin, but he was still skipping meetings, refusing to pick up the phone. He was depressed and sadly he told his mother, I might as well be dead. With the absenteeism, the deal with the record was never signed. Death. Around early 1988, Andy had seemingly beaten his drug addiction, and his health seemed normal. It was one of the most beautiful things to see. Everyone around him was proud and happy that he was doing well, and he was even ready to begin recording a new album. But there was still a big problem lurking around in his heart. Andy was still depressed, but it wasn't clear if he was depressed because of his breakup with Victoria, or if it was because he felt less of himself. Everything went downhill for him very fast. He was in a terrible state of depression. So, Andy found his way back into alcoholic habits and was receiving phone calls from brothers Maurice and Barry with last-ditch efforts to get Andy to stop. But Andy was already an adult at this time. There was little they could do for him. On March 5, 1988, Andy celebrated his 30th birthday in London while working on the new album. It was a big celebration that brightened the mood of family and friends, but this ecstatic feeling didn't last long as two days later, he was admitted to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, complaining of chest pains. At around 8.30 a.m. on March 10, 1988, Andy's doctor told him more tests were needed to determine the cause of his chest pains. Shortly afterward, Andy slumped into unconsciousness and died as a result of myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle most likely caused by a virus. This had happened because of years of cocaine use, which weakened his heart. It was so sad to see how Andy ended his life prematurely and tragically. Upon the announcement of his death, his ex-wife, Kim Reeder, was not surprised. She said she always knew that one day she would get a call with news that Andy died the way he did. He was only waiting for the time it would happen. Andy's family, however, said the cause of death was not an overdose, as some media reports suggested, but natural causes after years of substance abuse. Andy's body was flown to the United States, where he was interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Hollywood Hills, Los Angeles. Andy was greatly loved till his last days. The Andy Gibb Memorial Foundation was founded in his honor, and it contributes to charities that Andy supported, such as the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, and the Diabetes Research Institute. Even after almost four decades, we still remember what could have been if this great icon was still with us. 
But sadly, he has to live only in the hearts of his fans, friends, and family. What do you think about Andy Gibbs' life and death? What do you think could have been done to prevent a loss like this one? Let us know in the comments section. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.